At the beginning, I would like to give a brief introduction to the concept of economic models. I think this is very important because there is sometimes a misinterpretation of what economic models can do and what they can not do. And in addition, economic models are often criticized based on kind of unfair arguments or arguments that are actually not to the point. A reading recommendation in this context is the book by Danny Roderick that came out in 2015, Economics Rules, Why Economics Works, When It Fails, and How to Tell the Difference. In contrast to natural sciences, in most economic fields, there are no experiments possible, basically. For example, in macroeconomics, if you want to find out what the effect of education is on long-run economic growth, you generally cannot uh, kind of tell uh, the United States president to shut down all the schools for 10 years and afterwards we look what happens. So this is basically not possible. So there is something, a need for something that we can use as a substitute for experiments. And in economics, these are the formal mathematical models. And they are kind of supposed to be a mathematical replica of the economy that is analyzed. And in this mathematical replica, we can change parameters. For example, we can change parameters that are related to education and then look what happens to the outcome of uh, this model. So to the education trajectory, to the economic growth trajectory and so on and so forth. And these parameter changes or so-called comparative statics and comparative dynamics exercises. They are the counterpart to experiments in economics, basically. Of course, it's an imperfect counterpart, but it's the best that we have at our disposal. So a parameter change is kind of the analogous um, aspect to uh, an experiment in the natural sciences. Now, what's important in this context is that economic models are always a simplification. This is not kind of a, a problem, basically, but that is their precise aim. So models should be a simplification. They should abstract from many aspects of reality because only then we can derive results. We can interpret these results in a straightforward way and the, the model is then not a black box, but we can trace all the mechanisms. And in this context, you can think of economic models like uh, being a map that helps us to to, to find a certain location. If you look for a location on a the map, then it's usually a good thing that the map abstracts from certain aspects of reality that are not important for finding the certain location. So for example, the map abstracts from trees or from street lights and so on and so forth because they do not help to find us uh, the certain location that we are interested in. So this is exactly the precise aim of economic models. They should abstract from aspects that are not important for the question that we aim to analyze, but they should capture those aspects in which we are interested in reasonably well. What this means is best um, illustrated by means of an example. So one of the crucial assumptions in many economic models is the existence of an infinitely lived representative agent who makes all the economic decisions. That's, of course, a simplification because then we do not have to deal with millions of people in an economy with different preferences. And, um, of course, every economist knows that such an infinitely lived representative agent does not exist. However, with respect to many economic questions that we are interested in, this assumption is very useful because it simplifies uh, economic modeling considerably such that we can get insightful results, while it is at the same time rather innocuous. So that means, for example, if you want to analyze aspects related um, to long-run economic growth or to uh, the effects of monetary policies, then it's often not really important for the final result whether you assume millions of people who behave differently or one single representative agent. So for these questions, uh, the single representative agent assumption is justifiable. So in criticizing this assumption, the question should not basically be whether a certain simplification or a certain assumption is per se justified, but whether it is justified in the given setting and for the given question that we are interested, and particularly what the consequences of this assumption are for the outcomes. 
So with respect to the infinitely lift representative agent assumption, for example, this could be highly problematic if we are interested in analyzing demographic changes, for example, increasing life expectancy. Of course, if you have an infinitely lift representative agent, it doesn't make sense um, to pose the question at all because they are infinitely lift by definition. Or if you're interested in aspects related to uh, inequality dynamics. Of course, if there is only one representative agent, then inequality is not defined in this context. So with respect to these questions, the assumption is not innocuous, but with respect to many other questions, this assumption is innocuous and um, basically unproblematic. Another example in this context would be the often criticized assumption that individuals are rational that is often made in economic models. Of course, this does not imply that economists think that consumers go to the supermarket and solve Lagrangians in front of the supermarket shelves, but the outcome of such a Lagrange optimization problem where you maximize your utility subject to a certain budget constraint is nothing else than that we buy those goods that we like at, for the given price, and if the price increases, we might reconsider our choice. So basically, it predicts individual behavior comparatively well. Now, this does, of course, not mean that there are not uh, certain departures from rationality, but the assumption of rationality actually leads to predictions that are reasonably well in line with what we observe in reality. The alternative assumption of irrational behavior, that would be completely out of line with all what we observe in reality. So, for example, an irrational behavior would uh, arguably be if we are thirsty, that we go to the supermarket and buy a nail polisher and use it to wash our hair. And we don't usually encounter many people in the supermarket doing uh, such things. So basically, the rationality assumption is better suited to explain the behavior than many alternative assumptions. This does not imply, of course, that we should not refine the assumption of rational individuals, and this is done in a whole subfield of economics and behavioral economics. After all, models should help us to explain phenomena in the real world. And therefore, if a model is suited to explain what we find in the real world, if it passes the empirical test, this is uh, a really important um, aspect of of a model. So in general, the predictions of models should always be tested empirically. After this brief overview, we can now describe the modeling cycle in economics, which is basically how we build economic models and what the aim of these economic models is. And here we typically start here in the lower left corner, we observe a certain phenomenon that we would like to explain. We observe this in the real world. For example, we observe that some countries are richer and other countries are poorer, and we would like to explain this. Now, the first step in doing this is to construct a formal economic model of the aspects that we think might explain these cross-country differences. So, for example, the solo model, where we have videos um, later on that uh, describe the solo model, is an attempt the first attempt to explain cross-country differences by means of differences in investment and differences in capital accumulation. So what you do is you construct a model that should capture the aspect that you want to explain uh, reasonably well. Then you have a mathematical formulation, a formal model of the phenomenon that you would want to explain. And then you can analyze this model. You can do this by uh, means of an analytical um, of deriving analytical results, so that would be the comparative statics and comparative dynamics exercises where you change parameters and you look what the outcome uh, basically is. And if the results can be derived analytically, then you really have a kind of a, a channel there that you can uh, that you can trace and you can uh, post the results from an analytical perspective. Sometimes the models are too complicated to get analytical results, then one would have to resort to numerical analysis. So in this case, the model would be uh, simulated, so you would take parameter values that are reasonable, plug them in um, to the parameters of the model and solve the model in a, in a program like MATLAB, Mathematica and these kind of um, uh, software. 
And you would also often calibrate the model, so meaning that you adjust the parameters in a way that the outcome trajectories fit to the real-world uh, trajectories that we observe. Then in this case, you have a mathematical solution of uh, the problem. So you might, again, if we uh, think about the solo model that explains cross-country differences by means of differences in investment rates, you might have the result that indeed, from an analytical point of view, you can explain certain cross-country differences by differences in investment rates. But the numerical simulation of, um, uh, of the model would tell you that it can by far not explain the uh, size of the differences that we observe in reality. So what we would then do is we would interpret the results and would have then an explanation for the phenomenon that we aim uh, to explain. And this explanation, we would then test whether it's a reasonable explanation. So in case of the solo model and in case of um, this answer that cross-country differences are explained by differences in investment, we would test how much of the difference between the different countries can be explained by differences in investment rates. And then we would find out that a certain part can be explained, but by far not everything. So what we would then do is to start the modeling cycle again. So we observe that the model can explain a part of what we are interested in, but not everything. So we would refine the model. We would reformulate it and get another uh, formulation of a refined model, for example. In case of the solo model, you might add human capital to the model and to get the uh, so-called human capital augmented uh, solo model that Nancy and Homer and Weil uh, proposed in the 1990s. And then you would observe, if you again do these uh, steps here, that <clears throat> this human capital augmented uh, solo model can explain much more of the cross-country difference than um, the pure solo model where only uh, physical capital uh, tries to explain the differences between the different countries. However, in the end, if you test it empirically, you would still find out that some things are missing and you would again go back and uh, reformulate the model and so on until the empirical tests would um, kind of indicate that you found a solid explanation for what you are interested in. So how do standard economic models look like? Typically, we have a general equilibrium framework. What does this mean? This means that we have a certain... Um, depiction of uh, an economy where we have the households on one side and the firms on the other side and they interact on the market. So the households, for example, they buy consumption goods that are usually denoted by uh, C and they pay a certain price, PC, for these consumption goods. So they are on the demand side for the products in the economy. At the same time, however, households are on the supply side when it comes to uh, labor. So households usually supply their labor on the labor market and earn a wage that is usually denoted by W for supplying their labor. And also they supply their savings. So you carry your savings to the bank or you invest it in the stock market. And for this you get a return, which is usually the interest rate. Um, and the interest rate is the rate of return minus depreciation that is typically denoted by delta on your savings. So the households are the demand side for goods and the supply side for production factors. On the other side, you would have the firms. The firms produce the goods. If it's produced, it's usually denoted by Y. And they get the revenues for selling these goods on the market. And at the same time, the firms are on the demand side when it comes to production factors. So they demand workers and pay them a certain wage and they demand capital. So they go to the bank and ask for uh, loans and so on or finance themselves via the stock market and so on and so forth and have to pay the rate of return on investment. And then there is an interaction between these um, agents on the market. And the market basically ensures that a price vector in the end establishes such that markets are cleared. How does this work? Well, there are prices in the economy, not only for the goods, but the wage is also a price for labor. And the rate of return on capital is the price of capital, of savings. Now, if, for example, the firms would want to produce many more goods than the households would want to consume, then we would have an oversupply of goods. And that would mean that the price starts to fall. If the price falls, 
That means that firms would want to sell less of their uh, goods, of course, because they can earn less per um, good that they sell. And at the same time, the households would want to buy more of the goods because the price goes down. And this process would last until the market is in equilibrium again when supply is equal to demand. And the same holds true for labor. So, for example, if uh, the wage rate is very low, households would probably not want to supply a lot of um, their work with a going wage rate. At the same time, firms would demand for a lot of workers if the wage rate is low. So the demand would be higher than supply and that would lead to an increasing price of labor in this case, so an increasing wage rate. If the wage rate goes up, then, then it's clear that firms would um, demand less um, labor because the price goes up. And at the same time, households might be willing to supply more of labor. And this process would again continue until the market is in equilibrium anymore. Uh, again. So basically, in the general equilibrium, a price vector uh, establishes that ensures that markets are clear. And for this market clearing price vector, we can then usually compute the associated quantities. This slide just shows again the notation from the previous slide. So we have that final goods production is usually denoted by Y. So that's output of an economy or also it's gross domestic product. So the value of goods and services that are produced in an economy within a year. Capital is typically denoted by uppercase K. Labor by uppercase L and these are uh, the inputs for production. As I said, households buy these goods, so they uh, are on the demand side here, but they are on the supply side for the production factors. In equilibrium, demand should be equal to supply and the prices, the price for the goods, for the capital, the interest rate and the wages would adjust such that markets clear. Now, of course, this is a very, very simple structure of an economic model and it can be extended in various directions. For example, we could include a government that taxes incomes and might subsidize certain activities such as production, so they might have uh, subsidies for firms. We could introduce a central bank that supplies money and sets the interest rate and so on and so forth. And particularly, we could also introduce imperfect competition and certain market failures that might lead to situations when markets do not clear. And one such extension is uh, here on the next slide, where we have a, now a government. And this government, basically in this simple um, extension, taxes consumption, so you could have a value-added tax. It taxes wages, where you could have an income tax, so T uh, denotes a certain tax rate. And it could also be a subsidy. Right? It could also The government could also tax production of firms or tax their profits, but at the same time, they could also subsidize um, this. And if there is imperfect competition, for example, then firms might also make economic uh, profits and the profits are denoted by pi. And then these profits, something has to happen with these profits and typically firms are again owned by households. So small firms are often owned by families or so on. Then the profits are again redistributed to the households and the households can use them again to buy consumption goods. Um, so these families that own the firms can then use the profits or part of the profits to buy consumption goods. Or otherwise, if these are large firms that are traded on the stock market, then also investors uh, would be invested in these firms and they would get dividends and so on. So that would also be income that they can again spend on consumption goods. So this would be a brief overview on economic models, how they are structured, what they can do and what they cannot do, and uh, what we have to ask when we want to criticize assumptions. Thank you for your attention.